In all the years since the arrival of the Earhart colonization flotilla, no ship had ever crossed the outer boundaries of the Antares star system, and no signal had ever returned. The stellar miasma that for so long had interfered with communications between the nations of the Confederacy also served to isolate them from the outside galaxy. Before they even reached the outer confines of the system, communications had been lost with every probe, drone, and vessel that attempted to discover what lay beyond. The craft themselves were unharmed, as were their crews, but to explore the extent of the Antares miasma without communications at sublight speeds was to invite disaster. But 210 years after the flotilla first arrived, and just eight after the establishment of the Antares Confederacy, the means to overcome the stellar geography of the system were finally achieved. Centuries before, as the first colony ships had been disassembled to become rudimentary shelters, scientists across the star system had worked tirelessly to redevelop faster than light travel. Their presence within Antares in the first place had revealed the failures inherent to the wormhole gates, and desperately, they searched for another method. With Reunification Day came the opportunity for these disparate endeavors to share and further their research. While political interference threatened to derail these united efforts, progress made first under the Antares Assembly would bear fruit under the Antares Confederacy. At 2 p.m. Antares Universal Time, on November 14th, 210 AL, the CAS Earhart left its moorings in orbit of Lindaway and set course for a neighboring star system. Unlike the ships of her namesake, the Earhart's drive system would manipulate so-called cosmic strings. These filaments were theorized to be left over from the Big Bang and part of a pathway connecting every star in the galaxy. For a tense 19 days, there was no contact with the Earhart, until at last, the network of interstellar relay drones it had left behind in its wake were activated. For the first time, signals could pierce through the interference of the Antares miasma. The Earhart was quickly joined by her sister ships, and together they pushed the boundaries of the frontier. All too often, though, the search for answers brought only more questions. The first great revelation was that the miasma was far larger than initially believed. The Antares system was in fact merely on the edge of a colossal nebula, and within its depths lay every manner of discovery. Non-sapient life was quickly observed on an alien world, confirming what the Confederacy already knew. Life was not so rare across the galaxy. This would be overshadowed just months later, when an ancient capsule containing the remains of a long-dead extraterrestrial pilot was unearthed in yet another star system. The facts were undeniable. The human race was not alone in traveling across the stars. Not only that, but their remains and relics were everywhere. Most bizarre, however, was the unearthing of a tremendous skeleton. It was first believed to be a great mountain range, only to be later confirmed as a massive fossilized ribcage. Stranger still were the creature's origins. It was not native to the world on which it was found, instead materializing there seemingly without warning. Its unexpected arrival seemed almost to parallel that of the Earhart flotilla, transported unwillingly from some faraway place. As more and more alien artifacts and bizarre phenomena were uncovered, the Antares miasma began to resemble a type of dumping ground, a place where objects from across the galaxy had been taken, either at random or for some unknown purpose. The Great Silence of the Galaxy came to an abrupt end on June 6, 220 AL. The vessel encountered by the Earhart was at first believed to be a type of asteroid, as the forms of life aboard were almost unfathomable. For two years, attempts at communication were repeated before the last linguistic barriers were broken and diplomatic relations were formally established with the Cloister of the Spirits. The Numoi race transformed the traditional definition of life and challenged the Confederacy's greatest scientists. They resembled rocks or crystals more than anything that might be considered alive, at times dazzling, luminescent, almost magical in their movements. How precisely their electromagnetic fields conferred life and sentience would be studied for generations. Yet despite their astonishing appearance, they were capable of great empathy 
and had devoted themselves to what might be called a spiritual enlightenment. Once regular contact had been made, they showed tremendous interest in the religions of the Confederacy. According to their myths, their kind had found life after falling from the skies within a divine comet, and they found an unexpected kinship with the Confederacy's Imams upon learning of the Black Stone of the Kaaba in Mecca. The sense of friendship and trust that grew immediately upon contact with the Cloister of the Spirits would prove itself to be the exception. First contact with the Vrul in 224 was marked by threats of genocide, promises from their government to drown Antares beneath a tide of blood. The Vrul Salvation League resembled the worst aspects of Earth's fascist dictatorships, yet embraced and taken to a grotesque level. Their entire ideology was built on a foundation of widespread murder, seeing the other races of the galaxy as some kind of affront to be exterminated. Contact with the Vrul ushered in a wave of panic across the Confederacy. Just months prior, the government had narrowly rejected entering into a mutual defense treaty with the Cloister of the Spirits, only for the same treaty to then be approved with overwhelming support from Parliament. The frontier systems were fortified and the Confederacy braced for war. Yet it was a conflict the nation was ill-prepared for. The cost of space exploration had become so exorbitant that massive deficits rippled across every sector of the economy. The cost of consumer goods rose exponentially, inflation threatened to unravel entire republics, and the threat of the Vrul escalated public fears into a near hysteria. Each new system claimed came at the expense of immense effort as the Confederacy struggled to expand its presence across neighboring sectors of space. But with each new outpost and mining station came a trickling of raw resources desperately needed across Antares. The 240s were defined by a struggling national economy, but a rapid growth in the Confederacy's knowledge of the galaxy. The rate at which alien nations were encountered rose exponentially. Some were of comparative strength and ability to the Numoi or the Vrul, while others were transcendent in their technology, yet seemingly stagnant and isolationist. The Confederacy's diplomats were sent to dozens and then hundreds of worlds, becoming part of a developing interstellar, international system. In 242, these efforts brought the Confederacy to the attention of the galaxy's most active interstellar civilizations. Confederate diplomats, representatives from the republics, and a host of staff were assembled on the greatest diplomatic effort of the era. They would travel across the galaxy to represent their nation within a great galactic community. It would take years for the journey to be completed, but every citizen awaited whatever outcome might arise from such a grand undertaking. But the overtures of peaceful coexistence the Confederacy presented towards the galaxy were soon shattered. Over two decades, the Confederacy had learned to navigate the bellicose threats of the Vrul Salvation League and play a delicate game of brinkmanship. In that time, Confederate intelligence services had uncovered a wealth of information concerning the nature of Vrul society, and the details were appalling in their callousness. The term Salvation League, as translated by Confederate linguists, had initially been thought to refer to some kind of spiritual awakening, but was now recognized as being far more literal in its use. The Vrul's cultural elite had mobilized the lower classes in a relentless pursuit of industrial efficiency, and in their overwhelming desire for superiority, had forced their subjects to dig too greedily and too deep. So exhaustive were their efforts to extract their homeworld's resources that they had begun to fracture the planet's crust. A cataclysmic event was inevitable. The Salvation League had promised to lead the Vrul to a new world, and had even successfully colonized a nearby star system, but salvation was reserved only for their aristocracy. Their government had no desire to save their population, instead working them to death on the promise that they would one day be saved. Vrul Ho, homeworld of the Salvation League, fractured and collapsed in a fiery explosion on March 28, 249. A hastily arranged final evacuation effort saved only a fraction of the population, relocating them to Torix, the Vrul's single remaining colony. Since discovering the deteriorating nature of their homeworld, 
the Confederacy had offered the Salvation League aid time and time again, only to be rebuffed under a torrent of threats and insults. Letters smuggled to Antares from rural dissidents and captives had begged for help. They described, in tragic detail, the immense labor camps in which they were forced to work, only to be, for all intent and purposes, ignored by an isolationist Antares government unwilling to risk war. The destruction of Vrul Ho cast the entire Confederacy in a type of mourning, echoing the tragedies of Reunification Day and the loss of the eight fallen colonies. In Parliament, whenever senators and representatives spoke of the cataclysm, they did so with a kind of listless sorrow, breached only by the occasional outburst of anguish. The few Vrul who had escaped the destruction of their world had merely been forced to toil in the labor camps of another. Images obtained in the ensuing years by Confederate intelligence were presented to parliamentary committees. They showed the Vrul elite wallowing in luxury while their people struggled in poverty and disease. The Salvation League was simply restarting the process that had doomed their home world, grinding their own people into a sickly, bloody pulp to fuel their horrific industries. When the first reports became public of what had become of the Vrul survivors, something awoke across the citizens of the Antares Confederacy. A rekindling of the ancient martial spirit of humanity, a spark that had long been dormant, but never extinguished. On every world, in every republic, there arose a feeling of righteous fury. Enlistment skyrocketed. Armament factories began operating day and night. Shipyards burned with the fires of molten alloys, pressed into the hulls of future starships. Every republic was preparing for war, and each looked to Sagallo to see if the Confederacy would do the same. When the Prime Minister formally requested that Parliament declare a state of war, the legislature collapsed into near chaos. Fiery speeches from proponents on both sides nearly turned violent, but it was clear that the case for intervention would not be satiated by diplomatic condemnations, embargoes, or blockades. Only war would do. In the Chamber of Representatives, every speech calling for a declaration unleashed a near riot of support. In the Senate, as each republic took to the floor and voiced their call to arms, they were met by a torrent of thunderous applause. By the time the last republic cast their vote, the roars of approval had grown so loud that the voices of their representatives were entirely drowned out. But the rhetoric belied the true state of the Antares armed forces. Since the arrival of the Earhart flotilla, no military unit had ever fired a shot in anger. In peacetime, the Confederate Navy had been mocked as little more than lifeguards guarding the pool that was the Antares miasma, while the army was referred to as chocolate soldiers, sure to melt under the first sign of pressure. When mobilization was declared, armies from every republic were placed under federal service, but each had its own equipment, doctrine, and leadership. Frustrated admirals ordered ships to rendezvous at rally stations only to discover that they had been assigned elsewhere, or in some cases, had not even been fully commissioned yet. When the invasion force finally crossed the boundaries into rural space, many expected disaster. But Confederate General Staff was hardly blind to its own deficiencies. Rather than engaging the rural directly, the Navy's strategy relied on conducting a series of hit-and-run attacks isolating local strongholds and only engaging them once Vrul ships were known to be unable to counterattack in time. Despite fears of insurmountable alien death rays or other exotic weaponry, the Vrul's technology seemed roughly equivalent and Confederate forces could expect to engage them on a level playing field. While the careful strategy selected by the Confederate Navy would not bring any swift victory, its reticence allowed the Confederate Army the time it needed to standardize and train its new armies. Finally, the Navy broke the stalemate, seeking out a decisive battle. In a short but brutal engagement, the Antares fleet decimated a smaller force of rule, and the route to their world of Torix lay open. It was only when the vast armada of troop ships approached the Vrul colony that their strategy revealed itself. A hidden reserve force had waited in a neighboring system, 
intending to destroy the defenseless transports while the Confederate Navy bombarded the planet. It was only by the barest of margins that an escort flotilla was able to intercept the Vrul, but the main Confederate fleet was forced to disengage and support the escalating naval action. When the Confederate Army landed, it did so without any orbital support. The liberation of Torix spiraled into disaster. Without orbital bombardment, networks of defensive emplacements on the surface were able to fire with impunity. General Peddard, Supreme Commander of the Invasion Force, was killed in orbit, and of the 18 divisions committed to the planet, only three landed in their specified zones. The rest were cast across a hostile world, isolated and undersupplied. For 29 days, scattered Confederate units desperately held their improvised landing sites against the Vrul, lacking centralized leadership or even widespread communications. Physically, the Vrul were far superior, possessing a strength that bordered on the supernatural. Colonel Talik Salahadeen, commander of an armored brigade that had landed well outside its intended target, would prove to be the deciding factor. Merging whatever ad hoc Confederate units he stumbled across into his own, he rapidly organized a relentless armored assault into the heart of rural resistance. By the time the Confederate Navy had reappeared in low orbit of Torix, he had become the de facto commander of nearly half the invasion force and encircled a rural formation roughly double the size of his own. The surrender of the Vrul Salvation League ended the first interstellar war fought by the Confederate Republics of Antares, and would later be recognized by historians as a pivotal turning point in the nation's character. The feeling of discovery and possibility that the second colonization effort had brought to the nation was over, replaced by the responsibility of managing a new interstellar government. Debate would rage for years on whether to incorporate the Vrul as a republic within the Confederacy or establish for them a new independent state. At the same time, proposals for a grand federation with the Cloister of the Spirits were heard within the halls of Parliament, and the first colony outside the Antares system would succeed beyond the wildest expectations. The Confederacy had overcome its first challenges, and an entire galaxy of opportunity and danger lay open to it but no single event would compare to the nation's first meeting within the galactic community. The journey of the Confederate delegation had taken years, and it would be years more before the results of any discussions held would be brought back to Antares. But in a vast domed hall, a beautiful alien structure that defied the imagination, the Confederate Republics of Antares joined for the first time the great races of the galaxy. The arrival of each delegation was marked by a grandiose ceremony. One by one, alien banners were raised and the names of mighty nations echoed across the chamber. The Skren Solar Republic, the Free States of Brian, the Confederate Republics of Antares, the Eternal Empire of Ikara, the Cloister of the Spirits. The banners and names went on and on, but there was one above all that would forever be burned into the history of Antares. When its representatives arrived within the hall and its name boomed across the assembled hosts, even Tanya Lissipoli, the veteran diplomat who decades earlier had helped draft the Confederate Constitution, could not contain her shock and horror. High above them all, amidst the flags and banners of the nations of the galaxy, was unfurled the standard of the United Terran Protectorates. In Stellaris Invicta, the Templin Institute guides the Antares Confederacy into an uncertain future, one you can influence. Every Saturday, we'll livestream our progress on our Twitch channel, and our viewers and patrons will have the opportunity to vote on decisions and shape the history of the galaxy. If you missed the live stream, you can catch up on what happened when the stream is published the next day to the Templin Archives channel. Then, once a month, we'll produce a video like this one, detailing everything that's progressed in the Confederacy's struggle to return to Earth. The next live stream of Stellaris Invicta Season 2 begins one hour after this video has gone live. And while you're waiting, we've added some new posters and t-shirts and other merchandise to the Templin Commissary. You'll find the link in the description.